what's HELIB? HELIB is uh, actually a software library. It's implementing uh, homomorphic encryption. In particular, it implements the uh, ring LWE variant of the crypto system due to uh, uh, Tsvika, Craig, and uh, Vinod from uh, two years ago. The library is written in C++. It uh, uses uh, as its math library uh, uh, Victor's NTL, uh, mostly for polynomial arithmetic. Uh, it's available as an open source under the GPL license, and you can find it uh, off of GitHub. Uh, what's implemented there? So, in some sense, HELIB has two levels. Uh, on the bottom level is the implementation of the crypto system itself. So, as uh, Rafi said in the previous talk, a crypto system has encryption, decryption, evaluation, that kind of thing. This is what's implemented in the uh, lower level of HELIB. Um, and a useful analogy to think of HELIB, both for this token in general, is it gives you the equivalent of a hardware platform. It tells you what are the quantities that you can operate on homomorphically, it tells you what operations you can apply to them, and it tells you how much these operations cost. So in that sense, it sort of gives you a platform to work on. And then if you want to do something more complicated than the basic operation that the hardware platform gives you, you do what you do when you need to write something over some platform. You write a higher level algorithm and you implement it over the operations that you are given. Uh, and this is what's implemented in the higher level uh, uh, of HELIB. There are some algorithms to do things like routing, like simple linear functions, like matrix vector multiplication, uh, polynomial evaluation, things like that. Uh, why, do we choose, why did we choose to uh, implement those? Well, these are the things that we thought would be useful if we wanted to do bootstrapping. Uh, so we started by implementing that. In this talk, I'm only gonna talk about the routing algorithm. Uh, what is the HE platform? So the most uh, fundamental thing about this library are the things that are encrypted are actually vectors. They're vectors over some finite field. Uh, as a user of that library, you have a pretty free choice of what final feed you want to work over. Um, and, but the length of this vector is actually determined by other parameters. You determine the field, you determine the depth of the circuits that you want to support, and other things like the security parameters. And that determines all kinds of other pa parameters, which eventually would tell you how large are your vectors. The typical values that we have, each, vec each encrypted vector contains somewhere between 100 and 1,000 uh, elements of the field. Uh, what are the operations that you can apply? Essentially three operations. You can take these vectors and do a cyclic rotations on them, uh, and you can add or multiply these vectors pointwise. Uh, that is essentially a SIMD architecture. SIMD is a single instruction, multiple data. It means, well, you want to add? Sure, I'll go ahead and add, but I'm gonna add each one of these things independently. That's SIMD. And I wanted to point out that there actually are hardware, real hardware platforms that do SIMD. Uh, Intel in their processor have uh, this SSE, and uh, IBM and Motorola have a similar thing called Altivec, and there are uh, available and people write programs that use them and stuff like that. Um, specifically, the HE platform, here are the operation and their cost. There are actually two measures of cost. Um, in homomorphic encryption, the, all the schemes that we have so far, ciphertexts are noisy, each operation adds to the noise and uh, you have some noise capacity. Once the noise grows beyond something, uh, you can't decrypt anymore. This you can think of as circuit depth. You can do operations, but once you do too many operations on the same ciphertext, uh, it's dead, it's, it's broken, you can't use it anymore. Um, so I broke the uh, operations here, the cost into cheap, moderate, and expensive. Addition, you can add either to ciphertext or ciphertext to a constant, and they are both cheap. Uh, you can multiply either to ciphertext or ciphertext by a constant. Um, multiplying two ciphertext is expensive in terms of both the time that it takes to implement it and the noise that it adds. Multiplying by a constant is cheap in terms of how long it takes to implement it, but it does add some noise. And uh, rotations, well, it's an expensive operation to, mul to implement, but it doesn't add much noise. Uh, one point that I wanna uh, make here is about multiplication by constant. 
Um, you can think in additive, typical additive homomorphic encryption schemes, if you multiply something by a zero or a one, that's basically for free, because multiplying by a zero, you just get a zero. Multiplying by one, you just leave it alone. Uh, this is not the case here. We're multiplying uh, vectors, and if you multiply by a zero, one vector, you, the operation is quick, but you do pay in noise. And you pay quite a bit. It's sort of close to, it's not exactly the same amount of noise that you would get by multiplying two ciphertext, but it's not very far off. So you actually do pay by multiplying by constant, even if these constants are zeros and ones. Uh, and multiplying by zero and one is a very, very useful operation that we use a lot in this library. Everything that I said so far was a lie. Uh, well, it's not a lie, but it is approximate. Um, and uh, well, you can read the paper and you see a few more details, or you can read an excruciatingly detailed design document if you really want to get the whole truth. Uh, with that, let me talk about routing in HELIB. So the goal is to move plain text value between different slots in, this, uh, uh, in these vectors. And the native operations that the crypto system gives us is the ability to do ro the cyclic rotations or shifts. In this talk, I'm not gonna distinguish between just shift and, and the cyclic rotation. Um, but we may wanna do more. So the basic thing that implemented in the library is a procedure that uh, you take an arbitrary permutation that you want to um, apply to this, uh, crypt, to this uh, ciphertext, and you use rotations and shifts and that to implement it. So that's the basic operation. Um, how do we do that? So we do this using a concept that's called shift net, that we call shift network. I'll, des I'll describe what it is in a minute. Um, we implement these shift ne networks based on Banish networks because we get cheap Shift, net, shift network these ways. Uh, we use two different ways to generalize Banish networks and we trade them off for performance. So let's start by talking about what shift networks is. Let's start by a shift column. Uh, this is a naive way of uh, implementing a permutation if all you have are shifts. Um, so think of a permutation pi and for every index of this permutation, think of how many indexes it need to travel under pi. So in the case of this, in the case of this permutation, uh, the first index needs to travel by three positions. So the shift column would say plus three in its first index, and the last one needs to travel one up, so the last index here would say minus one. So this is the idea. We're just gonna use it to implement the permutation in a very simple way. We're gonna multiply by a zero one uh, mask in order to zero out everything except the indexes that need to travel three, and then we shift it by three. And we're gonna multiply it by a different mask of everything that has to travel uh, a minus one, and then we shift it by one to the other direction, and then we're gonna add up all of these things, and what we gain, what we, gain, what we get uh, is the, uh, permuted vector at the end. Um, so this is a, a particularly simple and easy way to uh, implement a permutation using the algebraic operations that we have at our disposal. Um, and the cost of it, well, how much does it cost us? The expensive operation here is the shift, and the number of shifts that we have is the number of different non-zero um, numbers that are written in that vector. Uh, in terms of uh, depth, this is a depth one because you take your original thing and then multiply it by many different constants and shift each one of them separately and add. So there is, the depth here is one multiplication by constant and then some other uh, operations that don't cost much in terms of uh, depth or noise. Uh, so that's a shift column. What's a shift network? A shift network is just a sequence of those, right? So if you have a whole bunch of shift columns, uh, each one of them correspond to a particular permutation then uh, the permutation that you get out of applying each one of them is, well, you get the first permutation concatenated with the second, concatenated with the third, et cetera. The cost is the sum of the costs. The depth is just the number of columns that you have here because the depth of each column is one. Um, uh, so that defined for us an optimization problem. We called it the cheapest shift network problem. Uh, the input is a particular permutation that you want to implement, uh, and some bound on the depth. And the, what you want to find is the cheapest shift network that you can have in terms of the number of 
shifts that you're gonna need to do uh, that implements that permutation. So it's a well-defined uh, problem. It seems interesting one, uh, it's an interesting problem. And you can ask questions like, is this a hard problem? Is it an easy problem? Is it NP-hard? Can you approximate it up to a constant factor? We don't know the answers to any of them. We know that you can approximate it to up to a log n factor because that's easy. Uh, what we do is we, s we define some class of natural solutions that in particular is guaranteed to include within it uh, a log n approximation, but hopefully even better. And then we actually search for the best uh, solution uh, within that class. This is the thing that's actually implemented uh, in the library. Uh, so let me talk about the class of uh, shift networks that we're uh, dealing with. They're all bas based on a Banish or a Waxman network. Um, the original Banish or Waxman networks uh, has a power of two number of uh, elements in its vectors. And what it is is just two back-to-back -back butterflies. Uh, you can see that it has um, two log n, two n minus one layers, and each layer consists of these things. These are a whole bunch of exchanges like that. Each, ex each exchange has two straight edges and two cross edges, and it's controlled by a bit that tells you whether you need to send these elements on the cross edges or on the straight edges. And the theorem due to Benesch and Waxman from the 60s, uh, separately, uh, says that uh, every permutation, uh, there is a setting of the control bits that would get you that permutation. And the way you prove it is, well, a Benesch network is nice and recursive in structure. There's the first layer, the last layer, and two small Benesch networks in between. Uh, and what you do is you take in each one of your input, you map it to either the top or the bottom part, uh, you recursively permute these, and then you map them to, its, uh, to their, their place. You need to prove that there's always a way to do that, and the proof is not hard. Um, one thing that you can do if you want to use Banish networks, but you want to uh, live within a shorter, a, a smaller depth bound, is you can collapse levels. So, oh, sorry, before that. One, in, what good, one property that's important for us is that at every level of the Banish network, all the exchanges have the same delta. So this guy is, have each, each, each of these elements have to travel either straight, which means that the delta is zero, or up or down, which means that the delta is plus four or minus four for this layer, plus two or minus two for this layer, plus one or minus one for this layer. So every level has cost two because you need at most two shifts in order to implement it. Uh, so the cost is two, the depth is two n minus one and the cost is twice that. Um, okay, so now if you want to live within a smaller depth bound, you collapse level. So instead of using Banish network for this, we're gonna use a single shift column for that permutation here. And then we're gonna have instead of uh, uh, depth five, we're gonna have depth three. Uh, and the cost could increase because the number of sh different shift amounts that we're gonna have in this thing, uh, well, potentially we can get anything that, uh, anything that can be uh, obtained as zero plus minus delta one plus something which is zero or plus minus delta two, et cetera, can happen in this thing. So the cost could, could grow. Uh, let me talk about some extension of a Banish network. So the first extension uh, due to Lev, Pippinger, and Valiant, uh, instead of breaking it into two parts, you're gonna break it into some other number of parts. In particular, if n is somewhat smooth, you can uh, break it into a product of, num of uh, integers like that. Uh, then in your recursion, you recurse on a1, and inside of, inside of here, you recurse on a2, et cetera. Uh, so first of all, you have to prove that it's still possible to break the inputs in such a way and then recursively uh, uh, route in this and then um, uh, bring them back to their place. Um, it's not hard to prove. The proof is a little more complicated in this case, but it's not very hard. Um, and the second thing from our perspective, the cost of each level is bigger. So instead of uh, zero plus minus delta, here it's zero plus minus delta plus minus two delta. And in general, if you break it into A1 parts, it's gonna be two A1 minus one uh, different shift amounts, non-zero shift amounts. Um, so you get uh, this cost and this depth. So this is one uh, generalization of Banish network. A different generalization of Banish network, which actually can, you can apply to any n, uh, due to, 
Chung and Melham, um, is, uh, well, I'm, I'm not, now I'm gonna break it into two parts, but I'm not gonna insist that these two parts are equal. They, they'll be almost the same. So if n was even, then I could break it into two equal parts. But if n was odd, well, I'm gonna break it into two parts that are almost equal. Uh, in this case, uh, two and three, or three and two. Uh, the big part uh, would have one node that has to go on a straight edge, but every, all, all the other nodes can go on either st straight or cross edge. And there are actually two different ways to do it. In this case, let's say that we insist that the guy, the guy with only straight edge is the bottom one in the big part. Um, and so if you break it this way with the little uh, part on top, then each one of these guys would have to travel in this example two. And if you break it in this other way, it has to travel three. Now this choice is actually important in our case because when you're inside the recursion, you have many subnetworks. Some of them will have even the, um, size, others would have odd size. And you wanna make sure that the shift amounts that you have in the odd size matches the one that you have in the even size. So you're gonna use this, uh, this choice that you're given in order to decide how to break it. And this way you can still ensure that each level of your network has only two shift amounts. Uh, so the cost and the depth will be uh, the same as they were in the um, original Banish network. Um, and there's a question of whether these two, the, so I presented two generalization, one where it's, uh, you break it into two parts not equal, one you break it into many parts, but they are equal, and the question is can you uh, generalize it to uh, one uh, big generalization? And well, it clearly you can, but the question is can you prove that it works? And we didn't know the answer to that, but uh, luckily uh, Mark was a student in, in our group this uh, summer, so I asked him this the first uh, week that he was there, and a day or two later he came and showed me that this is indeed possible. So these are, uh, are actually uh, instances of the same thing. Uh, okay, coming back to what we do in the library. So we're given a size of a network N. We don't work on the particular permutation, but rather we work on some network that would be good for every permutation for these vectors. Um, and the bound, and what we do is we just set up a big dynamic program that goes over all the possibility of splitting N into shifts, then building this generalized Banach network for each part, uh, sorry, breaking N into factors, uh, building uh, Banach networks for each factor, uh, and then uh, collapsing layers in, in this Banach network so you, if you need to, and among all these options, it just chooses the best, uh, the lowest cost network. So I wanted to, uh, show you a few numbers, so these are a few numbers. Um, M is the size of your lattices, it depends on the security parameter and the depth. Roughly, uh, the depth of the circuit that you can evaluate is M over a thousand. So this is good for depth four circuits, this is good for depth 40 circuits, and you can see that uh, it, the time that to implement an arbitrary permutation here ranges between a second or two to uh, um, slightly under a minute. Uh, so with that, I'm almost done. The only thing that, other thing that I wanted to say is this. Uh, as of last week, uh, Victor and I have an implementation of bootstrapping. Uh, we sort of have an implementation of bootstrapping. It works most of the time. Uh, we're still debugging it. Uh, there are very significant optimizations that are not included yet. Basically, by the time we finished implementing it, we realized how we should have gone impl about implementing it. Uh, so we're doing it again. Uh, the depth of bootstrapping here is 20. By the time we're done, it should be around 12. And the time is about an hour uh, in, for these parameters. So uh, this would probably get smaller as well as we implement our implement. And we hope to release that into the, the open source library in maybe two months or so. So that's it. Thank you.